In this episode, we'll be talking about attacks of the wind, wind of all kinds. The plasma component of a micronova is electric wind, so we've actually already begun in previous episodes. But here, let's begin with some wind basics, and the wind we know. The Chan Thomas version of the catastrophe we heard in episode 1, where the Earth basically stops in its tracks and a thousand mile per hour winds race across the planet, is unreasonable and impossible everywhere outside the equatorial zone since the higher latitudes are not rotating nearly as quickly. Not only would a gradual change over just hours leave considerable braking potential to that worst case scenario, that goes double for those higher latitudes. Not to mention that in some areas the wind at surface level is not even going in the direction of rotation, especially around pressure cells, and the movements of those cells complicate the matter of wind even more. When you bring in the upper winds, you could get major instabilities, and even a gradual slowdown there would mean windstorms of a few hundred miles an hour whipping across various zones at once. Something like the polar vortex way above the surface and flying fast around the polar region would actually have the chance to be the most devastating wind element, since its speed would sustain and couple downwards in various unpredictable ways as the Earth's rotation changed. The point here is that the wind would be very bad, but not the thousand mile per hour bad, and not homogenous across the globe. Tilts of the crust, by the way, complicate that location forecasting of the wind even more, and that is even before you consider the Hadley cells, feral cells, and polar cells, and how they would be affected. The picture presented is one of nearly absolute uncertainty, other than the fact that any change to rotation or tilt would likely leave very few places in the world without seeing at least one windstorm of about 200 miles per hour, maybe more, with others seeing it much, much worse. But apart from the wind that we know, which would have the potential to whip at dangerous speeds, there's the electromagnetic wind, the first component of which in a solar micronova would be the relativistic particles sent out, traveling at almost the speed of light, which would act like a terrible CME and would arrive before the dust and glass spherules and other parts of the shell. These are cosmic rays and they can penetrate the atmosphere, the crust, and even to the core of Earth. They create cloud condensation nuclei, attract vapor and dust, and can literally cloud out and darken the skies in a few minutes if the surge was great enough. By the way, these particles also help juice up the ionosphere and global electric circuit, which further plays a role in the winds at surface level as extra electric intensity makes high pressure higher and low pressure lower. But let's go big here. Let's talk galactic electromagnetic wind, and let's talk a mechanism of causing a solar micronova or great rare superflare type outburst. The thing is, while a galactic superwave would do the trick electrically, we don't even need one. You see, the sun's magnetic fields are carried out by its electromagnetic wind, and it does so rippling through the planetary orbital planes such that the solar wind causes the planets to cross this sector boundary of the sun's electric plasma current sheet, which is not at all unlike the Earth's equatorial ion fountain, except the sun's carries the solar current out past Pluto. But the same general idea of outward current at the equatorial zone exists. But just as Earth's is naturally wavy, so is the sun's, no getting around it. And so while Earth's slightly tilted orbit takes us to 7 degrees north of the solar equator in the fall, 7 degrees south in the spring, making for two crossings of the solar equator each year, the current sheet rippling skirt of electric plasma hits us every two weeks. Now, let's take this scalability to the galactic scale. Our plasma lab director, Billy, favors the notion that the galaxy has this current sheet too. And while the sun and solar system orbit every 250 million years around the galaxy, and while we actually cross the galactic plane every few million years, the galactic current sheet of electromagnetic wind should ripple too, and the sun should cross that extra energy zone much more often maybe say every 12,000 years, who knows. The point is that just like Earth, 
we orbit in one direction, but with the electric wind, in this case coming from the galaxy, the sun's heliosphere is blown away from that center, not away from the direction we're moving. The modeling of galactic magnetic fields is getting exceptional and further implicates that this galactic wind exists and is rippling just like the sun's plasma current sheet. And so while the stars aren't moving up and down like this as they orbit through the galaxy, at least not this quickly, the galactic current sheet absolutely could be. The point is that if we are looking for an electromagnetic trigger for the Sun, a galactic shockwave is one way to do it, but if we indeed see galactic scale currents and magnetic fields changing direction and energy level on much shorter time scales, it's hard to envision any physical mechanism by which the Sun would not take an incredible surge, just as the Earth does during such crossings, or we could actually get geomagnetic electric storms just like when a CME hits Earth. So why would it be any different when the sun takes that same surge from the galaxy. <laughs>